What's up, people? Jay here with PWFEmpire.com for another edition of WTF, aka the Weekly Top 5. We're going to go ahead and kick things off with some huge news from this week's SmackDown taping. There's been a new stipulation added to the Team Authority versus Team Cena main event that's set to take place at Survivor Series. The Authority isn't the only unit at risk of losing something this Sunday, because while their power may be on the line, the jobs of Team Cena will be too. It was announced that if the Authority wins, every member of Team Cena will be fired. Except for John Cena himself. Which leads me to our question of the week. Did WWE overplay their hand by adding this stipulation, or did it actually add some intrigue to the match? If every member of Team Cena except Cena is at risk of being fired, then this completely changes the dynamic of the match and it opens up so many possibilities. All of the members of the team had to have some level of faith in John Cena to willingly join him in a fight against the power structure in WWE, but now they're placed in a situation where He's the only one that has nothing to lose. Now that may sound crazy seeing as John Cena was originally the focus of this match. After all, he was the reason why the match was booked in the first place. But when Vince McMahon came back and announced that the Authority's jobs were going to be on the line, everything changed. This is basically the Authority engaging in subterfuge, a last ditch effort to sabotage Team Cena. On Monday Night Raw, we saw that they made it their mission to dismantle the team and cause internal conflict, and now they've placed everyone into a position where they have to be questioning where their loyalties should lie. We could get a scenario where a member of Team Cena actually deflects and joins the Authority mid-match. Picture this, the match comes down to just John Cena and another member of his team, whoever you want it to be, let's say, Dolph Ziggler and Dolph Ziggler sees that the odds aren't in their favor and he's looking at John Cena like well shit like if we lose this match I'm losing my job and he doesn't want that to happen so he knocks the shit out of John Cena walks off then the authority beats John Cena the next night on Monday Night Raw Dolph Ziggler effectively joins the authority he gets his job back on the spot the rest of those jabronis were too stupid to see the turning tide so they all end up fired and we move forward on that story or hey maybe the whole team turns on his ass who knows they just have so many possibilities to play with based off of this stipulation and they also do have the option without the twists and the turns of just playing the match straight imagine a scenario where cena is the sole survivor for his team and he has to fight through the authority just to save everyone else's jobs win or lose either way i think it opens up potentially great stories to move forward with so I think this new Survivor Series stipulation is a great thing, but I want to hear from you guys, so let me know what you think down in the comments below. Speaking of Survivor Series, we had a lot of fun at Eric Rowan's expense on the last episode of PWTR because it just seemed like the move to add him to Team Cena came completely out of nowhere. And now we've heard from Sheamus himself that he actually did go to the hospital and he was injured and he's having surgery, so he was pulled from the match. But even with Sheamus' injury, a user from Reddit has actually provided an interesting explanation as to why Eric Rowan was added to this match and how it could possibly make sense from a storyline perspective. The user basically said that Luke Harper joined the Wyatt family as a means of carrying out destruction, while Eric Rowan had the mind of a scared and abused child, so he joined the Wyatt family for protection. And after all that Bray Wyatt had done to set them free, Luke Harper turned right around and betrayed the core of Bray Wyatt's message, betrayed his vision by joining the machine that the Wyatt family was intent on destroying. And with Rowan looking at Bray as a father figure, he took an affront to that. He was pissed off and he decided to do something about it. Thus, the reason why he joined Team Cena. Thank you to Nathan aka Pope Nation on Twitter for sending me the link to that explanation and I guess he knows me and you guys should know me by now too. Mr. Greek Tragedy. I love some good overanalyzing but as interesting as that story sounds, here's my issue. I had absolutely no reason in the world to care about Eric Rowan before Monday. And I'm not one of those guys that believes just because something is shocking and surprising that it's automatically entertaining. Hell, Hornswoggle joining Team Cena would have been more shocking than Eric Rowan joining, but I damn sure wasn't going to be jumping for joy with that. I, I would have been jumping probably out of a window or something, but I digress. 
WWE wanted to raise the stakes for this match. And to put it very simply, adding Eric Rowan to the mix does not live up to that image that they're attempting to project. I was initially thinking that this match was much bigger than any story that they possibly could tell between Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. But Sheamus was legitimately injured and somebody had to take the spot. And now that I'm able to view things in perspective, I'm a bit more understanding. But even still, <laughs> I had that mental image like looking at the pecking order of WWE and I had to come to the realization that after Sheamus, next in line is Eric Rowan? Like, goddamn, like, wow, is this really the state of the company? This is the best that you could do? So then I actually took a look at WWE's active roster and yeah, <laughs> it was the best that they could do. The choice to go with Rowan in this spot probably was made much easier because of his connection to Luke Harper, but as far as I'm concerned, you didn't have to put his ass in the match either. A lot of people have suggested that even Triple H should have been on Team Authority, and that makes a lot of sense because after all, if your power, your power is on the line, wouldn't you want a direct hand in making sure things go the exact way that you want them to? While I think that that's right in theory, it's wrong in execution because if you truly wanted to give the authority the absolute best shot at winning, you would put Stephanie in the match instead because hell, between her and Triple H, she's the only one that has actually won a match this year. In this week's rumor report, I'm hearing rumblings that AJ Lee may be done with WWE after Survivor Series. But then again, that very same website that I read that story from, a few hours later, they ran another story saying that, oh no, it's not Survivor Series, it's, it, it's TLC because she's advertised for WWE dates all the way up till that show, but nothing after. So that being said, go ahead and take this story with a huge ass grain of salt. If AJ does end up leaving WWE, then we all know what, or should I say who, influenced that decision. But even if she doesn't leave WWE anytime soon, this still opens the floor to a conversation that I've been wanting to have for a while now. And now it's even more appropriate because apparently going into Survivor Series, the fate of women's wrestling rests on AJ Lee's shoulders because God forbid somebody from Total Divas wins a Divas Championship. Before I even read this rumor, I was already preparing an article about AJ for PWF Empire. So I went back and I took a look at her career. I've heard so much talk about how good AJ is and I literally can't think of one moment where I've ever actually seen it be put into effect. Seriously, please point me in the direction of the defining moment of her career. One great match, one moment where she is quintessential AJ Lee. And I'm not even asking that rhetorically. I really want to know. And if you're preparing yourself to say, oh, of course, that pipe bombshell promo that she cut on the Total Divas. I do have to take issue with that. That entire promo was based on the false paradigm that AJ was any different than the rest of the Divas. For years, we've heard about what great potential she has, but why is it that when the other Divas don't produce results, people can easily admit that they're subpar or just flat out suck, but when it comes to AJ, there's always an excuse. The Total Divas may have gained notoriety through their show and not their wrestling talent, but how the hell can AJ or anyone else sit here and claim that her rise to prominence in WWE was any more noble than that? You can talk about talent all damn day long, but truth be told, AJ's in-ring work or anything that she's ever done in relation to the Divas division in WWE was not what made her as popular as she is today. She didn't really start to hit her stride in WWE until she was put into a storyline relationship with Daniel Bryan and then CM Punk, and then Kane, and then John Cena, and then Dolph Ziggler. The fundamental truth to AJ's rise to prominence in WWE is this. When AJ wasn't sticking her tongue down somebody's throat, WWE was shoving her down ours. Paired with multiple top guys, a wedding angle, special guest referee to a title match on a pay-per-view, constantly interfering in other matches, and a completely out-of-nowhere run as general manager of Raw. 
They forcibly shoehorned her into every single crevice of the company's screen time that they possibly could have in an effort to get her over. And hey, it worked, but most of that shit that I just named sounds like it could have been a storyline on Total Divas. So how does any of that grant her consideration over any of the other divas in WWE? And I'm not even saying that AJ is terrible. It very well may be that WWE just isn't booking her correctly, or maybe she doesn't have adequate competition in the divas division. Remember those excuses that I was talking about earlier? But even if any of that is the case, that doesn't negate the importance of this conversation. I'm curious to know where we draw the line between what someone could be and what they actually are. Not assuming greatness, but waiting for it to present itself. And if we draw a clear and defined line between the two, I have to say, AJ is severely overrated. Remember those reports about Spike TV canceling Impact from a few months back? Well, it turns out they actually were true because TNA announced that they were going to be leaving Spike TV and they also announced a new TV deal with the Destination America Network. And if you're asking yourself right now, what the fuck is a Destination America Network? Trust me, you're not alone. But regardless, this news was met with a great response from the TNA supporters. You had fans and even some members of the roster parading all over social media saying, yeah, what now? Suck it, haters. TNA isn't going out of business. TNA isn't dead. Who the fuck do you think you are, 50 Cent? I've been nicked with a few shells, but I don't walk with a limp. <laughs> Remember when 50 Cent used to rap about getting shot nine times as if it was an achievement equivalent of winning the Nobel fucking Peace Prize? Well, that's because bragging about avoiding death works for rappers, not for TNA. You're bragging about not going out of business after your horribly mismanaged company got kicked off one network, then out of desperation signed a TV deal with another network nobody even knew existed before this week. And furthermore, Destination America is available in 40 million less homes than Spike TV was. So you're sacrificing 40% of your potential audience to move to a worse network for less money. Over the last few years, TNA brought in Hogan, Bischoff, Ric Flair, other big name talent, moved to Monday nights, went live, went on the road, and now most of that has either been scaled back significantly or put to an end completely. You've spent millions of dollars on growth, but where we stand today, you don't have shit to show for it. And you're celebrating as if the company isn't in a much worse position now than it was before all of that started. But that's none of my business though. <clears throat> Chamomile. For years I've heard people refer to TNA as nothing more than an indie promotion with a nice TV deal. Well, about that TV deal, <laughs> it ain't so nice anymore. One of their biggest problems is that they've been more worried about creating the illusion of being big time rather than actually putting in the work to make sure that you get there. And going to war with WWE did more damage to your company than it did to them. So how about making your first priority putting on the best product that you can? Completely forget WWE even exists and start figuring out what TNA is. And on that subject, for the love of God, please forget ECW exists too. Because I watched one of those shows that they did from the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York and I couldn't even finish the whole episode because they violated ECW's corpse worse than Triple H did Katie Vicks. Hopefully this serves as that much needed wake up call to get their shit together because now they're forced to finally accept the reality of what they truly are. You're no longer on a major network because you ain't major. They need to take this situation and use it as an opportunity to find their identity. Redefine what TNA is. Hell, rebrand, create a new look and feel to impact. And if you do those things, then I'll give you another shot in January. But if I don't see substantial changes in the way business is conducted in TNA, then I'll know you're right back to the status quo, AKA peddling bullshit. If that's the case, then I'll treat you exactly like I do right now. You may be celebrating the fact that TNA isn't dead, but my interest in you is.
And to close this video out, here are some updates on the Empire. PWTR's newest co-host, Duke, has a column up discussing NXT. He's detailing five talents that he would like to see brought up to the main roster and five talents that he would like to see brought to the unemployment line, I guess, because shit, he wants them to be fired, gone from the company completely. It's a pretty hilarious column, very insightful, so go ahead and check that out if you'd like. And the latest episode of PWTR is up on PWFEmpire.com as well. We preview Survivor Series, give our predictions for all of the matches, all of that good stuff. And speaking of Survivor Series, I will be doing a pre and post show for WWE's next pay-per-view. Well, not exactly. I, we're not going to go there. We've fucking been there, so... Yeah, anyway, if you want the specific times when all of that stuff is going to be occurring and because you want to join in on the fun, all you have to do is follow me on Twitter at PWTRJ. And another benefit of following me on Twitter, you get to suggest topics that you would like for me to discuss in future episodes of WTF. And speaking of the future, it is my time to go and I will catch you next time. Peace out.